In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. The start screen fades to black. From those shadows, a figure appears, looking at his reflection in a dirty mirror. It's dark. All we can see of his eyes are heavy shadows, as he stares into the glass, waving a hand in front of his face as if he's not sure he's really there. This is the player's first sight upon beginning the game Silent Hill 2. Without knowing it, they have already fallen deep down the rabbit hole. Silent Hill 2 is a game about deception and illusion. The protagonist, James, is a man who very recently murdered his terminally ill wife, and in a dissociative fit, drove to Silent Hill with her body stashed in his car. It is just after those events that we find James standing in the bathroom, and neither he nor the audience has any idea what he's done. But the game certainly does. The first image we see is James, his face reflected in the mirror. Not his real face, but a flipped image of it. A distorted image. A lie. The James we meet in the beginning of the game is not the real James, but the one he creates to escape reality. And strangest of all is that gesture, waving a hand in front of his face. It's out of place, and adds a surreal quality to the scene. James leans away from the mirror, and we see him face to face. He takes a deep breath, and then control shifts to the player. It's a strange, short scene. Without the knowledge that comes from having played it before, the scene is mystifying. Who is this man? What is he doing in this strange bathroom? Why does he seem to be psyching himself up for something? taking a deep, steadying breath, pausing in front of a mirror to collect himself. Presumably, he is setting the scene in his mind. His subconscious is developing the falsehoods it will need to keep up the delusion that Mary died of illness three years ago, and that James received a letter from her. The death in the past explains her absence without implicating James. The letter explains his sudden, inexplicable arrival in town all without letting his conscious mind know there's a body in the car. Of course, new players don't know that. They see a grimy, disgusting bathroom and a strange man taking a deep breath, preparing himself for something. Taking control, the player walks James out of the room and another scene begins. Why? Instead of having a long scene continue from the bathroom, why is this intro scene split? For one, it makes the player take the initiative action. Things start in the bathroom, but nothing interesting is happening. It's once the player takes a step outside that the story starts. The player becomes the instigator. It sets a sort of barrier between the two scenes, differentiating them. We are about to see two different James Sunderlands, and we won't see the first one again for a while. In the bathroom, he is developing the lie becoming the James we will know for the first half of the game. Outside, overlooking Toluca Lake, we meet the protagonist who will take us into town. It is a foggy, dismal-looking place. A voiceover from an unknown woman begins, after which James explains the letter and the circumstances of his arrival. It sounds grim and haunting to a new player, but it is even worse than they could imagine. This is how Silent Hill 2 begins. Not with a bang, but a heavy, all-too-telling sigh. The first area to include player control in the game is the entryway into town, from the parking lot through the woods and the graveyard. After the intro, where James explains his arrival and the letter, the player can fully take over. Behind him is the car he drove in, parked sideways with the door left open, not the way a normally functioning human would park their car. The first cutscene zooms out enough to show this strange way of parking, the first sign something is really wrong in an otherwise ordinary scene. From the beginning of the game, James is clearly unwell. 
He avoids eye contact and often withdraws into his own mind, not speaking to others. He says things that make no sense, takes actions that are disgusting or strange, and doesn't seem to be bothered by them. He is detached from reality, a defense mechanism meant to protect his mind from the memories of the murder. This is why he can stick his hand inside a disgusting toilet and not care, because he's not consciously registering what's happening to him. Multiple times throughout the game, he performs the action of waving his hand in front of his face, possibly part of his dissociative behavior, meant to reinforce his delusions. It often appears when someone questions his wife's death. The view past the wall is of some tall trees overlooking Lake Toluca beyond. Though it cannot be seen, it's easy to assume that somewhere over there is our final destination, the Lakeview Hotel. Already we can see the path James will have to take to finish his story. From here, however, there is only one path, the long, winding trek through the woods. For much of the walk, the camera is in front of James. We can't see where he's going, and we don't know what's waiting for him there. It's foggy, dark, and abandoned, with no sign of any life. Occasionally, a dog can be heard barking. This long, empty trek is an easy way for the developers to increase player anxiety, to make them feel trapped in Silent Hill, because they've traveled so far from the outside world to get here. And it emphasizes the fact that going to the town is a choice. James has a car, and he could turn around at any time. But not only does he choose to go to town, he makes this long walk on foot to get there. Halfway through his long trek to town, James comes to the graveyard. The location is an uncomfortable one. It's a physical reminder of death. And this isn't a pleasant graveyard, even by basic standards. It's not well kept, and the ground seems to be sinking into Toluca Lake, a symbol that will be heavily associated with death throughout the game and the rest of the series. The eerie fog draping the landscape sets the scene for a tense, unhappy conversation. Here's where we meet Angela. She's a young woman wearing conservative, thick clothing with plain, long brown hair. The only bright color of the outfit is red. Blood and fire are both going to be associated with Angela. And in a somewhat graphic note, I have always thought the red pants was meant to be associated with bleeding down the legs. The outfit is thick, long-sleeved and protective, covering all but the hands and face. It's armor, and Angela wears it as a shield, on top of moving and behaving in ways that are defensive. She keeps her limbs close to her side and chest, moves in short, quick bursts so she can react faster and get away quicker, and she hides behind her long hair. She's in the graveyard, arriving at one of the gravestones. After a moment, she turns away, only to hesitate, turn around, and look again. When James approaches, it scares her. He apologizes, explains he's lost, and the reaction he gets from Angela is one of utter shock and confusion. Her behavior, words, and choices are all due to what is clearly a toxic mix of depression, suicidal idealization, and PTSD. She is both afraid to die and suffer more, and afraid to live and suffer more. Either way is suffering. This indecision, fear, and pain is a heady emotional cocktail that feeds every interaction between Angela and James. During the conversation in the graveyard, Angela is nervous, shy, and unsure. She second-guesses herself, apologizes for her behaviors, and stutters. While later she'll be angry and cruel to James, here she acts cordially. It is only when her traumas are forced to the surface that she lashes out. Her behavior all points to the harsh reality of her childhood. She angrily insists she's not lying when James decides to head into town, though James clearly did not think she was. A lifetime of being ignored and disbelieved has clearly made her fear that others do not trust or listen to her. She's quiet, stutters, and hesitates, all signs that show she's never been listened to. Every behavioral tick and word choice tells us more about how awfully she's been treated in life. The fact that we first meet her here, in the graveyard, is a dark sign. We see her lingering by graves, walking away, then turning and looking back. She's thinking about death, brooding on it. 
It is so deeply tied to her story, and it's clear from the beginning when we see her considering the grave so carefully. Notice that the item which will become her trademark isn't here. We don't see the knife at all until we meet her for the second time. Though a strange person, she is not obviously disturbed in this scene. The town of Silent Hill is much the same. It's gray, abandoned, quiet. James's entrance into town is subtle, even peaceful. The first game had the player watch as the hero and his daughter experienced a car crash where the father wakes to find himself alone and enters town. No monsters had been seen yet, but the premise was already horrifying. Yet James just walks into town. No big crash, no dramatic scene. What we don't know is that the tragic moment that put all of this into motion already happened. The player knows this is a horror game and horrific things will clearly happen, but so far, nothing has. The longer the wait, the tenser everything gets. James enters town and still nothing happens. This is a game that slowly creeps up on you, building the tension as high as it can before it breaks. Moreover, it's a game where the true horror lies in replaying with the awful truth in your mind. That slow, easy entrance is more horrifying when you know what James did. The game opens so peacefully, in direct opposition to the reality of his actions. The dissonance is deeply upsetting. Once James enters town, he finds great smears of blood spread across the pavement. The trail of blood is the breadcrumbs that will lead the player to the next point of plot. The amount of blood is far too much for the injured to have survived. It also isn't the kind of bleeding that would come from a wound associated with the monster we find at the end of these tracks. It has no arms, it spews acid. Instead, it would take a great cut, a heavy blow to create that kind of bloody mess. Perhaps a blow from a great knife. We follow this track to a dirt road where the radio makes its first appearance, as well as the first monster, the lying figure. The lying figure is a monster that focuses on the feeling of being trapped. It looks as if it is stuck in a straitjacket made of flesh, and its torso writhes in constant agony. It walks almost bow-legged, stumbling as it struggles to be free from a prison it cannot escape. Unable to bear the trap of its own flesh, the monster is forced to suffer endlessly. When others are near, it attacks by spewing burning acid. The first level of the metaphor is simple. The body as a prison in which pain cannot be escaped. That was Mary's fate in the hospital. Her body and her hospital bed became a prison to her. She could not escape the pain or the inevitable fate that awaited her. It angered and upset her, to the point that she lashed out at those she loved. She spat acid, much like the lying figure does. The name is interesting too, since the figure is seen standing most of the time, but Mary was certainly a lying figure in the hospital bed. The scene ends and the town opens to further exploration for the player. Those familiar with town can run right over to Martin Street, pick up the apartment key, and move on. But there are important sites in town which shouldn't be overlooked. The optional side quest which leads to Martin Street starts in a trailer near the lower streets of town. Inside, James reads a note that says, I'll wait at Bar Neely's. The strange capitalization is the same as a message James finds a little later. There was a hole here. It's gone now. At the bar, James finds a map, which leads him to the question mark at the end of Martin Street, where a corpse with the apartment key is found. The map also shows a cut through from one side of town to the other. Likely, this man was trying to get through. This is the same path James is trying to take, which isn't exactly a ringing endorsement. The person who writes the first note says they'll wait, much like Mary said she will wait for James. The character who goes after this person is killed trying to find them. A bad omen for our protagonist. The line about the hole has interested fans of the game for years. There are many possible connections to make, from the holes James will use in the prison, to the hole which lets Henry travel the other world in Silent Hill 4. But here, what matters is not what the hole is, but the fact that it is gone. In Silent Hill 2, holes represent a way forward, an open path to the truth. 
They descend into darkness, but they also pull the player closer to the light, the truth. But here a hole is gone, and soon after James finds a corpse. Perhaps it is gone because this person lost. They died, and their truth went undiscovered. The player can explore and find multiple clues as to where to go, including maps and notes, but they are all left behind, abandoned, found next to corpses. It seems as if no one else has made it through, a sign perhaps that James is doomed to a similar fate. And with that, James has the key to the apartments and can enter the first real level of Silent Hill 2. Each location in the game means something to James. The town itself was the last place he and his wife were happy. The hotel is where they vacationed. The hospital relates to Mary's illness. So what do the apartments represent? In Silent Hill 4, we meet Frank Sunderland, James's father. There's a note in the story that mentions Frank has been the super at the apartments in Ashfield since they were built, at least 40 years. That almost guarantees that James spent his childhood living in the apartments. Even without this connection, apartments are homes and it seems plausible this area would represent home to James. In the apartments, we see representations of both James and Mary. Mary's clothes are on the mannequin in the room with the flashlight. It's here we see the doppelganger of James, the body slumped in a chair, a hint of James's future in the hotel, but it also likely represents him at home, slumped in front of the TV, missing his wife, lonely and depressed. Most significantly, the two instances in which Pyramid Head seems to abuse monsters both occur in the apartments. Once he leaves the apartments, Pyramid Head is never again seen behaving that way, though James sees him multiple times before the end of the game. What do these scenes of depravity symbolize? Has James entertained these thoughts or acted on them? Pyramid Head's behavior towards the monsters may reflect upon James's murder, whatever she said aloud to herself. She never did ask James to do anything, and can be seen struggling against him in the tape. The abuse Pyramid Head acts in symbolizes both James's act of murder and his repressed desires, which were tied into his pain and perhaps his motive for killing his wife. The most peculiar room in the apartments is arguably the butterfly room, which is filled with bugs and strange lights, and a hole which James must reach into. Butterflies have particular significance in Japanese culture, in relation to death in the afterlife, and can be viewed as bad omens. Maria has a butterfly tattoo, and this butterfly-filled room is a dimly lit bedroom. The connection here could easily be seen as a warning, that Maria and James's repressed sexuality, manifesting itself towards her, are dangerous and could lead to his downfall. The hole is a small foreshadowing of the dark pits James will leap into later. All of the holes which James encounters represent his situation. To move forward, he must use them, but he cannot see the way forward through them. Once he jumps down a hole, it is impossible to move back, much like how it is impossible to unlearn the truth once it is known. The holes are representative of the fact that learning the truth will probably destroy James, but that he must continue moving forward towards the truth, because it is impossible to turn back. The apartments see the player introduced to nearly all of the most essential players in the game, save one. Maria will appear after the player leaves this area, but Eddie, Laura, and Pyramid Head all appear for the first time, while Angela will return for her second appearance, establishing for the audience the central cast of the game. Laura's appearance is short. Her name is unknown, her face hard to see, yet she leaves a powerful impression. Attempting to reach a key leads to the girl stomping on James's hand and kicking it away, stalling his progress for seemingly no reason. She laughs at him before running away. The girl appears almost as a trickster and a disturbing figure in a town full of monstrous killers. Eddie and Angela are at least full grown and possibly armed. This little girl appears fragile, yet so far has presented the biggest obstacle to the player of anyone we've met. She has set herself against us, and we won't fully understand why for some time. Angela's second appearance is one of the most profound and famous scenes of the game. She's lying on the ground, 
a vulnerable pose, appearing to be contemplating a bloody knife. It's the first we've seen of this object, and it seems to be connected to her change in behavior. She was anxious, somewhat distant in the graveyard. Here she is far more confrontational and willing to speak her mind. It's hard not to think of the scene in the bathroom watching this scene. Mirrors have played such a major part of the environment thus far. In an interesting way, this scene seems to be a reversal of the first, where James was putting on his false face in the bathroom. Here is the first time we will see the real Angela. She says what she means. She has the weapon she committed her crime with, and she seems to question James's reason for being in town. While we see James's reflection, his false image in the mirror, we often see Angela's real body, or both her face and reflection at the same time. Yet at the end of the scene, she falters. Worried about her mental state, she gives James the knife, and her true feelings disappear back into the fog. The first time we see Eddie, he is crouched over the toilet hurling his guts out, an understandable reaction to finding yourself in Silent Hill. Nearby, there's a fridge with a dead body in it, and it's presumed that this is what upset Eddie. Eddie immediately begins proclaiming his innocence, a sign of his guilt, as James never even accuses him of anything. This first scene is gross. He continues vomiting the whole time and we're meant to be disgusted, and later to be disgusted by Eddie's behavior. He is in the wrong, and eventually we'll have to stop him. In the Woodside Apartments, James hears a horrid scream. When he finds the source, he sees Pyramid Head standing behind a set of bars watching him. In the next room, James finds a body that looks just like him, dead in front of the TV. It's implied Pyramid Head is the one who killed that person, that James's doom will come at the judge's hands. The clock puzzle is the first puzzle obstacle to overcome. Here we have a reference to the number three. Henry, Mildred, and Scott. Three scratches on the wall. Silent Hill is a place in which time does not seem to exist. Yet here is this ornate grandfather clock with a great big chime and a strange memo. The scars from the past shall remove the nail that stops time. Each set of three in this game relates to Angela, Eddie, and James. So what does this line really mean? Our three characters are all stopped in time. Their lives are over. Their scars are their past, which keep them immobile. They are nailed to the ground. James has come to Silent Hill for persecution, to suffer for his sins, to pay for his crimes. There are a lot of scenes with crucifixion-like imagery, and this line with the nail stands out. Is it too far to connect the nail to a need to be crucified, to pay for one's sins, to move forward in time? The next puzzle also includes the number three, three coins. The old man, the prisoner, and the snake, the reference to the Garden of Eden. But the lady in this puzzle is called the prisoner. This woman, in fact, resembles Angela, and is found in the mirror room where Angela hands James the knife. The image on Angela's is not just a woman, but a woman wearing a blindfold, a symbol often used to depict the personification of justice in Roman myth. The blindfold represents the idiom that justice is blind, that it is impartial. It associates Angela with a female figure of judgment. Eddie is the tempter here, trying to convince James to revel in the same depravity he does. He is the snake. The old man coin must be James. What are old men? Wise, learned, respected, but also celibate, beyond the age at which sex is either possible or considered normal. In one of the riddles, he is described as rotting. In the hardest difficulty, he is referred to as having all hungers sated, no sex drive. Before he can leave the apartments, James enters the stairwell which leads to the exit and comes face to face with Pyramid Head. But there really is no fight. Pyramid Head can't be hurt. The point is for James to survive until the alarm goes off. Then Pyramid Head exits the building and James goes after him. They use the same exit, the implication being James is following Pyramid Head. This is the start of Pyramid Head transforming from an enemy to a guiding force. He is leading James to the truth.
Once he escapes the apartments, James finds himself in the fog-filled streets of the town again. It is here he meets Laura for the second time. Still we don't know her name, and still she is an obstacle to us. She reveals she has knowledge about our missing wife, but refuses to inform us. She sits overhead, above us, and escapes over the back of the wall. Laura exists in another world apart from us, and time will tell what the difference is between James and Laura. In Silent Hill 2, Laura represents innocence. She doesn't see the dark side of Silent Hill, the monsters or the fog. It seems to appear as a normal town to her, likely because she's just a kid and doesn't carry the same pain and guilt our protagonists do. When we see her, she's often surrounded by signs of innocence. The scene on the wall shows childish drawings on the bricks below. In the hospital, we find the girl playing with teddy bears. In the hotel, she starts drawing on the window. It emphasizes how naive and innocent the girl is. She is only seen with characters who are considered innocent by the narrative, or who consider themselves innocent. Early in the game, James sees her a few times, but they are cut off from each other by barriers, bars, and walls. She runs from him, our first sign that he's not all that he seems. Early on, she also appears with Eddie, but after the scene in the bowling alley, they're never seen together again. At this point, Eddie is seemingly innocent. He vomits at the sight of violence and hasn't behaved violently towards us. That changes when we meet him next, which is why he never sees Laura again. Angela never meets Laura at all, as she is absolutely convinced of her own guilt, and the symbol of innocence never comes near her. Maria is never seen with her either, because Maria isn't real, but also because she isn't innocent. She's hiding something from James, and being absent whenever Laura is around is another clue something is wrong with her. When James finally remembers the truth of what happened, Laura appears to judge him at that moment, expressing the anger and disbelief of the player that this person we've believed in isn't who we thought he was. Only if he's forgiven by Mary and makes amends will Laura return. From here, James goes to Rosewater Park, the place which he believes may be his and Mary's special place. Instead of finding Mary, however, he finds Maria. The name may be one of the most famous and revered in Western Christian culture, both Mary and Maria being the same name in different cultures, most commonly associated with the Holy Mother of the Christian faith. The pious sanctity of that image translates onto Mary Shepherd. The game endows her with an aspect of holiness. The photo James carries of Mary is an idyllic vision. Her clothes are soft, pale, feminine colors haloed by the light of the flashlight, also pull on concepts of holiness and angelic aspects. She even has a virgin birth through intercourse with a god. Maria is created through Mary and Silent Hill, and no mortal man has any part in the proceedings. Maria is created solely for the redemption of man, a very specific man in our case, and she dies many times to redeem him. In this scenario, Mary Shepherd quite literally takes on the role of the Mother of God, and Maria becomes the Christ, born to redeem the sinful man. The story is hardly a direct metaphor, however, and there are other mythical and religious figures who can be tied to Maria. Take for instance the unruly first wife of Adam, Lilith, a story from Jewish folklore that developed into a rich occult tradition. Stories say that Lilith was the first woman made by God for Adam, who refused to lay down peacefully for him and be his wife. There are shades of Lilith in both Mary and Maria. She has been portrayed as a seductress, out to tempt poor men into damnation. Maria's role as the seductress leading James astray has shades of this weaponized feminine sexuality, but Silent Hill turns this on its head, where Lilith is a vile demon leading good men astray. James is already condemned as a criminal. Maria as a temptation is a way of testing James's spirit, a further measure of his desire for and worthiness of redemption. In this way, she's performing a good deed, because her actions allow him the chance to reject her, and thus to embrace redemption. 
James is clearly gobsmacked by Maria's appearance, trips over himself in conversation with her when they first meet. Maria's appearance is clearly reflective of his feelings about his dearly departed wife. He misses her, so his delusion manifests itself as her double, but his repressed sexual desires, refused for so long, manifest as a more sexually extroverted, assertive Mary. From Rosewater, James and Maria go to Pete's Bolorama, where Maria waits outside. She's never seen by any of the other characters besides James. James goes in and finds Eddie and Laura talking. There is also, of course, the infamous pizza Eddie eats. Each of the characters in the game have an escape from their painful reality. Maria represents James's escape. He hides his pain and sexual desire. Angela escapes with thoughts of self-harm. Eddie's escape is food. So we see the town offering him exactly what he wants as a distraction, pizza in the bowling alley. He's also shown being emotionally vulnerable to insults about his weight. Laura calls him a gutless fatso, and he immediately no longer cares about the girl. James leaves to find Laura by himself, while Eddie is left behind to eat his pizza. Here we have a hint at the reason for Eddie's downfall. Part of it is how many years he's suffered, his feelings of inadequacy, trying to rebuild his sense of self by embracing violence as a means of protection. He's sensitive to the words of others, and to protect himself from being hurt, he reacts with violence, here by refusing to care for Laura's safety. James and Maria chase after Laura, entering Heaven's Night, a place that's been theorized as a possible origin for the real Maria, given the posters on the wall hailing a Lady Maria. Maria gets them in using keys she has hidden on her person, implying a direct connection to the location. Of course, Heaven's Night is a strip club, associating Maria with sex and situations in which women and their sexuality are commodities. From here, Maria and James follow Laura into the second level of the game, Brookhaven Hospital. The treatment of the patients at Brookhaven is subtly hinted at as being abusive. There are images of hands reaching up out of the darkness, contorted in pain, near a message which says the patient will never go back into the dark, the basement's basement. One of the cells is painted in blood. Outside it, markings are carved into the floor where it appears someone was forcibly dragged inside. The fact that the hospital has no doctors and is filled with the bubblehead nurses stands out. Hospitals have become a large part of James's life in the past three years. He would have been in and out of them constantly, so his version of Brookhaven must be influenced by his experience. That he only sees the women, and these women are so grotesquely inhuman and perversely sexual, says something about James's experience. The hospital represents loss for him. Loss of Mary, his happiness, and of course, his sexuality. These women are mostly human, save for their grotesque faces. If you closely examine the faces, they are divided in half with strange infantile features, representing the child James and his wife never had. Three patients in the hospital appear to be related to the three main characters. One of them has attempted suicide, another believes he is guilty of causing his daughter's death and has suffered a psychotic break and delusions. The third is violent, with a persecution complex. The central puzzle of the level is the Louise puzzle, a box with four locks centered around the story of a patient named Joseph. Following the clues to unlock the four locks leads the player through the whole of the hospital and gives them a dark look into the note writer, Joseph's experiences as a patient. After finding the keys, the player must find two codes to unlock the other locks on the box. One is found on a piece of typewriter paper in an office and the last is found after James is shoved off the roof by Pyramid Head and falls into the special treatment ward. The box itself is chained to a bed in the patient ward, and once it is unlocked, it simply reveals a piece of hair. On the wall next to the box, a line reads, Louise, I'll take care of you forever. It's my destiny. What's happening in this story? We have Joseph trying to protect a Louise, creating a box locked very intricately, 
hiding all its pieces across the hospital. The further into the puzzle the player goes, the more it seems Joseph is losing his sense of self. Joseph and Louise, James and Laura. Joseph is James, divided between delusion and awareness. And the closer he gets to the truth, the stranger he becomes. To enter the special treatment ward, James must be pushed off the roof. He would never jump himself. But later, James is never again forced into a hole. He jumps willingly. Someone in their right mind would never jump into a bottomless pit. James does. The box has four locks. James travels to four locations. Each place brings him closer to the truth and further unravels his delusions, until he remembers that Mary is dead because of him. In the hospital, we see vivid religious imagery in the form of the Lady of the Door. The way through this door is to find two rings, lead and copper, in the hospital and place them on the Lady's hand. The significance of the two rings is obvious wedding rings, one for the bride and groom. But the poem sounds more like a scene of judgment and damnation than a marriage ceremony. The angel is a woman wearing a veil over her hair with her head down, reaching out her arms. There is guilt in her bearing and how she lowers her head, but there is salvation in the hands reaching out as if to guide. The rings themselves are twisted things. One is found in a refrigerator, which can only be opened once James is with Maria. It must be done as a team or as in marriage. Only two people can open the fridge to get the ring. This particular ring, the lead one, is marked with a bloated, ugly corpse, symbolizing death. This is the door which lets Maria and James enter the long hallway leading out of the hospital. And it is here Maria dies. They are married and then separated. Maria is killed because she went through the door, because they got married. Pyramid Head runs her through, and her body goes limp as she slips away and the door closes. But the moment she dies, there's a telling clue. The hand between the doors goes limp and gives the player a clear view of a ring. James, devastated by the loss, falls to the floor of the elevator. We see how deeply he is affected by the loss of Maria. But is it the loss of her, or the loss of his wife figure? This has unsettled him and begun to uproot his delusions. Outside the hospital, James almost admits to the truth. Mary, is this your way of... Before he leaves the hospital, James enters a doctor's office, and here we find the last note written on a map, a quote about being stared at from across the abyss. This doctor's words both open and close the hospital level, and these lines are a clear reference to Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, specifically this famous line, He who fights with monsters should be careful lest he thereby become a monster, and if thou gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will also gaze into thee. The abyss is obviously Silent Hill, the dark power at the heart of this town. But unlike the original quote, this letter says, across the abyss. James begins his journey at the Overlook, looking out over Toluca Lake. Across it is the Lakeview Hotel, the final level of the game where Mary is waiting. James is not yet bold enough to stare across the abyss at Mary. He cannot face her. He cannot face up to what he has done. But the truth can only be learned by marching forward. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, and eventually James will make it to the truth. When James and Mary came to Silent Hill, they were tourists, and presumably they explored town. A place like the Historical Society makes sense as a destination. But he doesn't stay here for long. James must descend once again, leaving normal time and space, traveling under the lake, back in time to the Toluca prison that existed decades ago. The player doesn't enter the prison right away. There are a few rooms to visit. The room with the roaches and the lock which needs the battery to proceed. A strange puzzle. James must use the battery and then guess the code to the door before the roaches drain him of his life. He's trapped in a prison cell, and it's not the last time he'll be trapped in this level. From there, he begins to jump down various holes, deeper into darkness. There's no longer any sense of place here. 
He falls into a well and must once again set himself free from a makeshift prison cell. This level is focused entirely on incarceration. Silent Hill 2 is a game about committing crimes and guilt. No wonder that the penultimate level is a prison. All three characters are guilty or full guilty about something, and they've yet to come to terms with what it is they've done. In the prison, and the level attached to it, the labyrinth, all three will be pushed to their breaking points, forced to confront the truth. To escape the prison, James must find three items, a horseshoe, a wax doll, and a lighter. To obtain the horseshoe, James must complete the gallows puzzle by placing the three Aztec tablets into the gallows. There's a scream, the sound of someone being hung, and the horseshoe appears nearby, which can then be used to unlock a hole into the morgue. James goes from the gallows where someone dies on through to the morgue, symbolically escaping prison by dying. The prison leads us into another dream world, a nowhere place, the labyrinth. A labyrinth isn't the same as a maze. In a maze, there are multiple entry points and exits. A labyrinth has only one entrance, one exit, and many false starts and dead ends. It is a singular path to an ultimate goal, where traditionally in myth, monsters like the Minotaur have been found. In the Silent Hill Labyrinth, there is only one path, the path that leads to the truth. James's monster is Pyramid Head skulking around in the shadows. The choice of a labyrinth implies the same thing as the holes James jumps through, or the long walk to the places he's been. There is no going back. There is only one way forward to the truth. Here, James finds Angela cornered by Abstract Daddy, a creature that represents her abusive father. The room the boss appears in is fleshy, with pistons constantly moving in the walls. There's a TV in the room, a strange mundane piece of furniture, reflecting the strange mundanity of the whole level. The imagery of ordinary life becomes hellish when your daily life is hell. Eddie also has a few powerful scenes in this level, his final scenes. The player fights him as a boss and is forced to kill him to survive. He has become wild, manic, and paranoid, seeing everything as a threat and takes James's innocuous comments as insults. For James, the pivotal moment is the scene with Maria, where she sits imprisoned in a cell, drifting back and forth between the personalities of Mary and Maria. Seeing this, he is truly forced to reevaluate who she is and why she's here, because clearly something is wrong with her. All three face the ultimate representation of their pain and their crimes, James is forced to see what Maria is and isn't, and is forced to watch her die again. Angela's scene is heartbreaking. She turns on James, associating him with the men in her life. She suffered so much, she can no longer bring herself to trust anyone, as her life has shown her that isn't safe. It's also a sign that perhaps James is like these men, and in certain endings of the game, he has more in common with abusers than the abused. Eddie's scene has consequences for James, too. After his death, James is devastated to have killed a human being. Of course, he's killed before, and his thoughts and body language in the scene show us he's begun to truly remember. If the letter from Mary is examined at this point, it is revealed to be blank. Eddie and Angela are both tragic figures, but only one of them becomes a boss to be killed. She only punished those guilty of hurting her, while well, Eddie's vengeance spread to the innocent, and particularly to animals, a well-known sign of mental disturbance. In Silent Hill, Eddie is constantly seen armed next to dead bodies from the first moment he's met. Later, it's implied he killed the people he's found next to. He's begun to kill for enjoyment, not for vengeance or to escape an abusive situation, but because he likes it. He shows a desire and willingness to kill the innocent, for this reason, he becomes James's enemy. The end of the labyrinth presents the player with two rooms, each with six nooses. In one room, there are bodies. In the other, empty ropes, each associated with a crime. The player is meant to discern who the innocent person is and set them free. 
once again, the themes of guilt and innocence are woven into the mechanics of the game, and the cutscene where he pulls the noose to solve the puzzle makes it look as if he is about to go to the rope, implying his own guilt. Once the player escapes the prison, they finally come face to face with the obstacle that has hung in the background of the whole game, the lake. The lake has always been something he would have to overcome. There's only one way to go, across the water to the hotel. Throughout the long, anxiety-ridden trip, the player is undoubtedly thinking about that dark surface and what can't be seen underneath, about the possibility that something is going to jump out or of all the bodies we know are lying down there. Nothing happens, but it is a haunting and tense scene. The Lakeview Hotel is the final destination of Silent Hill 2. Yet it doesn't start that way. In the beginning, James tries to think of a special place and thinks of Rosewater Park. Only later does he decide the hotel must be where Mary is waiting for him. The hotel is where their vacation would have begun and where it would have ended. It might be that James doesn't think of the place fondly because it represents the end of the happiness he and Mary shared, the beginning of their tragedy. The first main puzzle we encounter in this location is the music box. It requires finding three music boxes and placing them on an ornate music player in the center of the main hall. Each box has a theme based on a fairy tale. The easiest to find is the Little Mermaid, found on one of the fountains outside the hotel. The second is Cinderella, found with another puzzle involving a set of briefcases and a photograph. The last is Snow White, found in the pantry, next to a can of apples James will comment has a bad smell. Finding all three creates the perfect melody. The boxes will rotate into the device and three new ones will appear along with the key. Six different fairy tales are referenced here. Three James finds and the three that appear when the box is unlocked, including Thumbelina, the small girl on the flower, Rapunzel, the princess with long hair, and Red Shoes, a less well-known story about a vain woman cursed to dance forever in her pretty shoes until the woman had her feet cut off to escape it. The stories are all fairy tales made famous either by Hans Christian Andersen or the Brothers Grimm, each focused on a princess who struggles through many trials and tribulations before finally finding some manner of peace. All the stories involve tragedy and loss, and a few end with the main character's death. Both James and Mary have suffered a great deal over the years, but now in the Lakeview Hotel, the chance for a peaceful resolution has come though not a happy one. They have a chance to come to terms with what's happened, and perhaps Mary can finally ascend to heaven. The level focuses upon letting go of burdens, of revealing the truth, letting go of the past. To move forward, James enters an elevator that will not allow him to take anything with him. He must let go in order to move on. The last time we see Angela is the scene in the hotel on the fiery staircase. If the final confrontation with Eddie showed us he became a monster we couldn't save, the final scene with Angela shows us she's someone we can't reach. She spends the cutscene above us on the stairs, too far to touch, and slowly moves away from James. The scene is seen from James's point of view at certain times. Specifically, when Angela asks if James thinks he's going to save her by loving her and take away all her pain. It's not just James Angela speaks to, but us. Throughout the game, she's been presented as someone hurt and broken, someone we wanted to save. In the fight with Abstract Daddy, James saved her from physical violence, but he can't save her emotionally. No one can do that for another person. That is what Angela is challenging here. The idea that her problems can be solved with so simple a solution as someone else's love. James, however, has spent most of the game trying to do that, chasing Maria's affection as a balm to his own pain. It's not a cure, and Angela is trying to tell him that here. What Angela is trying to come to terms with is her abuse. How can she accept what she's been brought up to believe her whole life, that she deserved what happened? She can't accept it, but it's what appears to be true because of her experience. 
It's what she's been conditioned to believe. The truth she comes to accept is that she is guilty of deserving abuse. Silent Hill 2 is the story of abuse, how it mutates, how it transforms people. Angela cannot be helped and cannot be saved. This is not a generalized message about abused people. It is about how abuse itself conditions the abused person into believing self-destructive things, and how hard that mindset can be to break. Angela is unable to overcome on her own, and James, damaged himself, is incapable of helping her to do it. When James finally watches the videotape, the player is presented with a familiar scene that takes on a deadly transformation. Here and now we know the full truth of James's crime. He murdered his terminally ill wife. I've seen many comments on this issue since I started talking about Silent Hill Online. A lot of people don't quite understand the complexity of the situation presented by Mary and James. It's not surprising since not everyone has sat vigil at the bed of a dying person. One commenter even claimed that James never committed a crime because Mary was already dead, implying that once she was ill, she ceased to exist. People living with illness, including terminal illness, are very much alive. They are still people. James's crime is more than murder, it's betrayal. The terminally ill suffer and may even wish for death, as Mary does at times. The idea that the person she loved and trusted most would force it upon her never occurred to her. Death is a horrible thing, but it happens to all of us, and it's the duty of those left behind to stand vigil, to see them through it, to make their loved ones comfortable and happy as they can. James is ultimately guilty of being unable to face that terrible situation, to sit there and watch as the life fades until it is completely gone. He could not stare into the abyss. In some endings, James loved his wife and did it out of the wish she wouldn't suffer, but that's not in his hands. She suffered the pain of suffocation, and in those final moments could only be angry, confused, afraid, and terribly sad wondering why her husband would do this to her. That's the betrayal. Mary's death was inevitable, but instead of slipping away in her sleep, holding James's hand, she died screaming in pain because of her own husband. He denied her a peaceful death to make it happen more quickly. It wasn't his choice to make. And now that he's remembered, James faces Pyramid Head one last time. It's the first time we see him with his double, and between them hangs Maria, upside down, once more to die for James's crimes. This is her crucifixion, the final sacrifice for James's soul. But why is she killed here after he's remembered? Before her death was meant to deny him the placating distraction of her presence, remind him of the truth. Here it is a punishment. James says as much in his speech after her death. He wanted to be punished needed to be punished. Cameras in Silent Hill are often crooked, correlating with the twisted view of reality characters have. In this scene, James begins on his knees, talking about the truth and his need to punish himself. The longer he talks, the more the crooked camera straightens out. At the end, he stands. Seeing reality for what it is, his skewed vision straightens. When he finally does come to the end of the game, James does something he hasn't done at all throughout the story of Silent Hill 2. He ascends. We've seen him go down long stairwells, jump down holes, diving further and further into darkness. But now he knows the truth, and his new life, whatever it may be, begins. At the end, he ascends to climb out of hell and face Mary. Depending on the player's actions, the final boss may be Maria or Mary. For most of the endings, it's Maria in the guise of his wife. The final temptation is not a version of Mary, but a near copy of her. Maria's last attempt to make James want her. It's only after she's defeated that James is finally able to speak not with a doppelganger, but with Mary herself. Here 
here in these final scenes, we learn who James really is. He's one of the few characters in Silent Hill who so drastically changes based on the player's choice. Most of the other games change scenario, but not characterization. No matter what ending you get in the first game, Harry is the same person. But James can be interpreted as a devoted, heartbroken husband or an uncaring, abusive sex fiend, depending on how you play and what ending you get. The letter that Mary reads is long and painful, and it runs across various ideas, a rambling train of thought. There's so much truth in that letter. It is so real to my experience with loss and terminal illness. Heartbreaking, and like the rest of Silent Hill, its power comes from how authentic it is. Silent Hill 2 is such an important story. It's more than the fantastic storytelling and game design, more than the beautiful art and haunting score, the surprise twist. It's this, the true story dealing with something no one wants to deal with, something that most stories gloss over, that fiction rarely touches with such depth, respect, and truth. Of losing someone to terminal illness and how to recover from it, how to try and keep living with it despite everything. It's the depiction of assault, abuse, and bullying, and how it affects people, how it can destroy them and make them into monsters. <laughs>